So um, what this talk is going to cover is a container runtime that we've been building uh, called Rocket, and then also um, talk about specifications for containers and container images and how containers run, um, and then why, why, uh, why runtimes and, and specifications are important uh, to Mesos overall. All right. Now that that sounds interesting, you're free to leave. I won't judge you. Get pumped. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm Brandon Phillips. I'm the CTO and co-founder of CoreOS. Uh, been a systems engineer for a long time, worked on the kernel, worked on distributed systems for a while elsewhere. Um, and yeah, at CoreOS, uh, kind of, I don't know why my Twitter handle's on there, but um, at CoreOS, we build a number of open source projects, um, one of which is Rocket, um, but kind of the, the namesake is CoreOS Linux. Um, that was the first product that we, or I guess open source project that we built. Um, and CoreOS Linux is really good uh, in these environments, um, particularly like where you're using all the containers and you need to be using modern kernels to take advantage of all the bug fixes and feature enhancements that are required to get containers to actually work correctly. Um, so um, we ship a modern kernel for containers. Um, we have a rolling update model, which is quite a bit different than a lot of distros. Um, where they, they kind of have these snap LTS releases. Um, we ship just plain vanilla kernels, and we ship those kernels on a regular cadence. And then we include a number of container runtimes out of the box, including Docker, Rocket, and uh, systemd and spawn. Um, so this, this has gotten a lot of uh, traction. I believe it's used, I don't know, I think it was, I don't know if it still is, it, uh, being used in Mesospheres, DCOS, and elsewhere. Um, just a small little, uh, Linux that uh, kind of be thought of as a container hypervisor. And then we also build a number of other open source projects. Uh, I saw an etcd t-shirt in the crowd somewhere. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, we have etcd, which is a, a sort of a competitor to Zookeeper, um, built uh, to fix um, some of the things that we didn't really like about Zookeeper, um, including runtime reconfigurability, HTTP API to access the thing, and then also built on the Raft consensus protocol and Set of Zab. Um, CoreOS Linux, which we've covered, Rocket. Flannel is an overlay network system for containers, um, which I, could, I gave a talk earlier this week about, um, but you can check it out. And a lot of other stuff. And then um, CoreOS is also a company, so we have a number of commercial products. Uh, Tectonic is one of those. Uh, that's for, full CoreOS stack in Kubernetes. And then Quay.io is a container uh, hosting uh, registry. Okay, so I wanted to start with a user story of uh, containers um, and how we think about it from the developer side. Um, a lot of us uh, have to juggle both. We have to think about the um, deployment side. Um, you know, how do I get bits there? How do I keep them updated? How do they run? Um, but let's just go through this user story really quick. Uh, so a container, um, in a lot of cases, uh, the reason it's even interesting or important is because it's uh, some software engineer, maybe that's you, um, taking your code and packaging it up into an image, okay? And this image is something that ideally we're able to um, take a hash of it and ship it around and know that when we ship it to the other host, the hash is the same. Um, even better if we can take that hash, sign it with some public key cryptography, and know that, you know, the developer Alice who built it um, uh, actually has rights to be running code on that server. And then ideally what happens is that we have lots of these things and we're deploying them all over on different hosts and we have some sort of attestation that uh, our hosts are running software that we actually want them to be running. Um, pretty simple story, code to images to knowing what's running on our servers. Um, and so this, this fits pretty well with what uh, Mesos is trying to do with containers. Um, Mesos uh, has had containerizers for a long time, long before Docker or just containers in general started taking off in the last couple of years. Um, the Mesos containerizer uh, uses just regular Linux primitives to isolate from host system, so manipulating C groups and namespaces directly. Um, and you are kind of left with some parts, and so they essentially you have to figure out how, how you're going to build those images and how you're going to pull them onto the host, et cetera. Um, and then uh, furthermore, things like Marathon and Aurora uh, kind of just uh, fork and exec processes pretty well. 
So you can you know, have your Python script, which is in the examples, and um, as long as you have Python installed or whatever, it'll fork your exec and run that process. Um, and then, uh, so what I, what I want to discuss is a specification to kind of make the naming and finding and building of images something that uh, can be shared between lots of runtimes. Imagine like Docker, the Mesos containerizer, Rocket, et cetera, et cetera, sharing a, a single image format. Um, and then uh, also Rocket itself, which is a runtime that can be forked and exec, uh, which is useful if you've already built a thing that knows how to fork and exec stuff. Any questions here? Am I saying anything wrong? I've, I've not used Mesos in production. I'm just going from my understanding of the system. Okay, so I'm not messing up. Great, where well, everyone's being very polite. That's possible too. Um, so why don't we start by, uh, by going through this process of, of transforming code into a, a application container image. Um, so actually let me, I don't think I gave any context on the app container image spec. So uh, the application container image spec is a spec that we built um, along with a bunch of other folks, uh, including, uh, including folks from Mesosphere. Um, that uh, kind of defined uh, metadata and an image format for uh, container images. So um, why don't we, instead of trying to get all high and mighty, just look at the thing. It's way easier to look at, look at things directly than to guess. So um, I'm gonna be going through this little tutorial that you can find up on my GitHub repo and I have a directory called hacks, and it'll be the only one called mesos-rocket. Um, and so what we're gonna do is, the first step is that we're gonna actually make the binary. And I have a, a tool written in Go called host info, which displays a website and some information about the host or the container uh, in which the container is running, or the application is running. So the first two things that we need to do is we need to uh, make a directory to put the binary, and then we'll compile the thing. If you're not familiar with Go, you should probably should be. It's really quite an elegant, uh, nice language in a lot of ways. Um, I heard some chuckle out there, but we can fight later. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we, what, what happens here is that we build um, the image into a statically compiled uh, <clears throat> Linux binary. So if we look at this uh, in the rootfs, there's this oh, LTD, what am I doing? Um, sorry file, uh, you'll see that it's a statically linked, uh, not stripped binary. So great. We have a Linux binary that I compiled on my OSX machine where we are fully living the dream of the future. Um, and then the other piece is that we actually need to create an image out of this. Just having a binary is not enough to create a, an application container image. So I'll look here. Uh, there is a file called manifest. And this is what, uh, what the application container image defines as an image is a tarball that's compressed optionally and then encrypted optionally and uh, should be signed. Uh, inside that tarball is a rootfs directory that has the root file system of the container and then metadata that actually describes how do I run this container, um, what is this container gonna get me, whether it's like file systems is gonna uh, require mounted or ports, et cetera. And then um, very importantly, a name so we see here at the bottom, there's a name, um, and this name is, belongs to the DNS namespace. So uh, we have a mechanism whereby we can discover the file and, and get it onto our host. So um, this is, uh, this is the, the section that describes the binary that we're gonna run. We're gonna run it as root because we're doing a demo. And then um, what the actual uh, ports that it's gonna export. And then the user has the ability to um, provide additional metadata about where it was built from. Um, and this metadata is gonna become more and more important over time as uh, larger and larger organizations deploy code. Uh, at some point you're gonna be like, well, everything that we deployed uh, before this hash is terribly vulnerable. I would like to run a single query to figure out uh, if any of those copies are still running in my cluster. Um, right now we've kind of uh, just papered over this problem <laughs> in the whole container ecosystem. Uh, we have the latest tag for the most part. Sometimes people will tag new versions of their thing, but you have no idea what the heck's in the image that you're running. Um, and so including metadata that's queryable is gonna become a important, um, an important thing over time as this whole ecosystem matures. Any questions here? All right, 
So the last bit is that uh, we have a tool called AC tool. And what uh, AC tool does is it takes this uh, root file system, this manifest, and generates an ACI. And we're going to be putting it into this directory called www.data, where I'm going to be running a plain old HTTP server um, in just a moment. So uh, the next step is that um, we're going to GPG sign this thing um, with my GPG key. So if you'll pardon me for just a second while I find my passcode. Where is that window? Oh, there it is. Okay. And then hopefully not paste my key for everyone to see. All right. So we, uh, we've now signed the, the image. And um, I have a very simple um, thing in here. Uh, I'm, I'm going through very low level to describe to you the protocol and how it works. Um, and so the last bit is that we have an index.html that um, has a couple of meta tags in the head that describe where um, to actually find the hosted bits of the container image. This is really nice. So if you um, use Rocket, you can do things like, uh, I want to run coreos.com slash Rocket. All the bits are hosted in uh, S3 bucket, actually in a GitHub um, releases page. Um, so, but we, we, it's kind of like delegating a mail server. Like we own the name, coreos.com. It's under our TLS and our HTTPS. And then we tell you authoritatively where to find that image. So you can use um, very simple protocols to make this stuff globally distributed. Um, so uh, with all that done, we will uh, run the world's easiest HTTP server, uh, which is installed everywhere. <laughs> and um, it'll list it on port 80. Okay. Um, now that everything's all set up, I have a, a host here that has the latest version of Rocket that we released a couple days ago. Um, and we will tell this thing that um, we want to first trust the GPG key that's uh, up on example.com. Oh. So the last bit is that I have Etsy host set up so that example.com resolves to my laptop um, from this virtual machine. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll say, I want to trust example.com um, for uh, trust the GPG key that example.com gives me. Hmm, well that's bad. Oh, I know why. It's important to be in your web root before starting the web server. Okay, so what happened was that it made an HTTP request and got the keys. If this had been um, over HTTPS, by default, Rocket would have just trusted it without prompting, but since this is HTTP, it's saying, are you sure that the fingerprints match? So we kind of bootstrap off the TLS infrastructure by default. So it says, all right, I, I went ahead and I trusted that key and we wrote it into the configuration store. And then the last bit is that um, we will fetch it. Um, one of the reasons that we built Rocket was because we wanted uh, privilege separation between the thingy that's running the image and the thingy that's downloading and validating the image. So you'll notice that all the commands I've been running with Rocket until now were sudo. Um, that's because they had to write things as root because obviously you don't want your key store to be written as anyone except root. Uh, but we can, we're able to fetch things as non-root. So what that did was it downloaded the signature file, validated the signature was correct against the key that we just trusted, then valid, downloaded the ACI, validated the signature was correct, and then uh, imported it um, by, its, uh, by its identity, which is, which is the SHA-512 hash of the tar file. Cool. So what we've done is essentially by hand built a container image and then also imported it into our runtime. Now, the last bit is to actually run this thing. So uh, we went through, we fetched it, we ran it. Uh, we fetched it, so the last bit is to run it. Oh. Um, so it went through, it, it checked all the signatures again, and then it ran the thing. So if uh, everything is configured correctly, I should be able to hit, um, yeah. So uh, this is the application that we compiled and ran and downloaded onto our host, and it just displays you know, metadata on on, on the container that it finds itself in. Pretty straightforward uh, application, um, but it kind of gives you the concepts that are required to build up this whole stack. Cool. So while I'm on the topic of Rocket, I wanted to show off one, one other interesting thing that we did uh, in the latest release of Rocket. Um, we, we introduced this feature called uh, Clear Containers. Intel's been working with us on this. Um, 
And what this is, is it's a feature whereby uh, regular containers, Linux containers, they use C groups and namespaces. So um, a C group and namespace means that you share the host kernel. Um, with this latest feature that we added, um, what you're able to actually do is uh, <clears throat> you're able to execute, uh, well, let me, let me show this. So we have this example here where we're doing, um, we're doing a classic container um, that's executing a, a binary. Uh, how many of you have used system D? Oh my goodness, really? Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you haven't used system D, the good news is, is that you'll all get the opportunity to at some point in the future. Um, <laughs> every Linux distro in the world essentially has fully adopted system D. Um, and uh, I know that there's a lot of drama around system D, but honestly, it's, um, it's actually moved the, the technology field of Linux forward pretty significantly. So um, how many of you have used Screen to run a production service? I, I know this is being recorded, but please be honest. <laughs> All right, I know at least a quarter of us have done that in this room. Um, so uh, systemd run is like Screen, um, only that's been designed correctly. So, <laughs> so uh, systemd is an API-driven init system, so you can talk to it over an API. Um, and what systemd run does is that it creates an init file, a, a service file for systemd uh, in memory, and then tells systemd, please run this thing based on these command line args that are in my current command line. Um, this is very good because if you've ever ran things as screen, um, oftentimes you may expose environment variables that uh, are in your environment when you launch that screen session. Um, you may have U limits that are set based on your login user versus what the service should be doing. So with systemd run, you're able to set these things up correctly, and then they're actually monitored and put into a C group by the init system. So uh, you click systemd run, and what will happen is that Rocket is for forked off into the background and is uh, babysitted or being babysat by uh, systemd. And we can see here if we um, do systemctl status uh, that it's an actual proper system D thing. Um, one of the great things about system D is everything is in a C group. Um, so when I tell system D to kill something, it's everything that's killed, or everything that was ever launched by that process. And then uh, you'll notice here that um, Rocket, um, when, I, when I did that Rocket run, what's actually happening is that uh, that host info process is showing up as an actual process on the shared kernel, um, which is uh, you know how all of our containers work. They're just processes with additional metadata on them. Um, instead, what, uh, what we did with Intel is that we added this new feature called um, clear containers. And instead of having that process executing on, the, on that host kernel, um, oh, what happened here? Oop, authentication required. OK. Um, so where did that go? Uh oh, typing too fast. I do. Oh, I'm, I'm stupid. One, one second. Okay. Um, so uh, we launched we launched another system D service here. Let um, me SSH into the box a second time. So um, what you'll see here is that uh, we're running this uh, another container. We're running etcd, which is a key value store. Um, but you don't see an etcd pro process, and that's because what actually happened is that we launched a KVM instance and then put the container in there and then launched that KVM instance. And it all launched within about 100, 140 milliseconds um, to launch an entire second kernel, including the image. And so if, you're, if you um, go in here and do like sudo uh, rocket list, um, we should have this, uh, this um, etcd instance running two, three, seven, Well, I'm not remembering something, but um, what's actually happening is that this etcd process is executing um, over here in this container, but it's being fully enclosed in a virtualized environment. Um, so this gives you some extra security guarantees and isolates the container further from your hosting infrastructure. So that's a pretty cool feature that we just recently added into Rocket. All right, so, um, so Rocket, uh, 
as we've shown here, is a container runtime. It handles images. Uh, it can handle Docker images also. Uh, it's designed only for Linux. Um, there's, we're not fooling around with other operating systems. Um, and the, the thing that it does differently than a runtime like Docker is that uh, Rocket actually executes as a child process of the thingy that called it. Um, so it's not for, it's, it's, so if you do like Docker run today, it's an API call. It goes off and it talks to the Docker API. The Docker API then forks and execs and then babysits that process. This causes a number of problems, which I can detail some other time, but um, this, this makes it really easy to integrate Rocket into existing systems, Mesos included. Um, you can use it underneath whatever init system that you're using, et cetera. Um, and then uh, it has, uh, a very simple command line for doing simple things, and then also has configuration that you can pass on via JSON. And then one of the things that we very consciously did with Rocket was that we separated out the steps of execution. So stage zero is the thing that fetches, downloads, sets up the file system. Um, stage one is the thing that sets up namespaces and C groups. So we showed two examples of those stage ones, one of which does virtualization, the other which uses namespaces and C groups. And then the stage two is the application actually running. Um, and one interesting thing about the way Rocket is designed is that instead of uh, just executing a single process, you can execute multiple processes underneath a single Rocket run. Um, and this, this gives nice advantages, particularly when you th start thinking about virtualization, because in a lot of cases, there's a combination of processes together that make up a logical application that you may want to expose on a port. Imagine you have a static CDN server you have the actual web server instance, and then something that's pulling in all the latest assets. Uh, you don't want to restart your CDN server just because you have an update to the assets that you're supposed to be hosting from this instance. Um, all right, so let's, let's talk about the AppC spec um, in further detail. Um, there's the image format itself, uh, which, uh, as we discussed, was an ACI, a tarball, and then it's identified by a hash. There's image discovery, which uses DNS and HTTPS and HTML to transform from what is the name? <laughs> Notice the spelling of artifact there. So uh, my, the, <laughs> one of my co-maintainers is uh, from Australia, and he insists on everything being spelled correctly. Um, <laughs> so he made these slides. Uh, so we'll, we'll find the art T fact um, <laughs> based on uh, resolving the name um, over DNS and HTML and HTTPS. Uh, then we do cryptographic verification. We, do, we use GPG because it's very familiar, but we're also, uh, we have plans to have more sophisticated things. But developers are very comfortable with GPG because it fits in their Git workflow, et cetera. Um, and so uh, we can take this image, sign it, and, and verify it later. Uh, and then we also have the concept of a pod. Um, this is something that's very useful when you like, like I said, you have multiple applications or multiple processes that make up an application. And in a lot of cases, those applications may need to talk to each other, particularly over localhost. So um, uh, if, you, if you have like one process per container and they each have their own network namespace, this can lead to really, really inefficient uh, things. So imagine that I have like Redis and then I have an application that's using Redis as its cache. Um, and those are, it's, that's the only setup. Like it's just using it as a local cache. It's really ineffective if that, that, uh, that user of Redis needs to go all the way over through like a bridge or something um, into another network namespace to just be able to get its uh, access to its cache. If you have a local host loopback that's shared between those two things, it's a much more efficient uh, path through the kernel. Um, and then the last piece of the specification is the, the actual executor which defines the runtime environment. Um, how the isolators are set up, the networking, and the lifecycle. Um, and this thing actually has a test itself. So uh, we build an application container image that tests executors. And the idea here is that um, as additional uh, runtimes show up, um, we're able to test that those things actually are implementing the specification correctly. Um, and so far, we have a number of executors that have been built. Um, I know that. Uh, there's a prototype one on Mesos, but that, that's not very far along. Um, Apsera built one called Kerma. We built one called Rocket. There's been one built for FreeBSD called Jetpack. Um, essentially, there's, there's a number of people who are, are going down the route of building a Rocket uh, or a AppC runtime um, for their needs. 
All right, so since I submitted this talk, there have been new developments in the field. Um, we, uh, we, along with a number of other people inside of uh, this ecosystem, um, got together around um, a new spec called Open Containers. Um, and so one of the natural questions is, how is this open container spec that um, Docker has been putting out, uh, how is it related to the app container spec? Um, if you're familiar with XKCD or how uh, specifications work, I'm guessing that you can probably guess what's at that URL. Um, I won't reveal the, the secret there. But it has something to do with adding n plus 1 specs to solve the too many specs problem. Um, so uh, the OCI was, uh, was started very recently. Um, and it's under the Linux Foundation. And its initial goal is to create a container runtime format, um, which means configuration on disk and then defining the runtime environment for that container. Very similar to how the app container has, uh, like how the process is set up, how the namespaces are set up. The OCI is focusing on, I have a root file system that's already on disk, and then how do I actually execute that root file system? And uh, there's a uh, runtime implementation of this spec. Um, I'm hesitant to say that it implements the spec because we haven't actually made a release of the spec yet, um, but that is following along and um, trying to trace where the spec is going uh, called run C. So the major differences between these two things um, is that the app, app container format tackles this full stack, this full user story of I'm a developer, I have my code, I want to package it up into an image, I'll put that image on the internet along with my signature so that anyone, anywhere, whether they're using Mesos or Docker or Rocket or whatever they're using, are able to download that, verify that it was built by me, and then execute it um, in, in a similar way. Okay, so we, we tackle the, the concerns of image format, the actual runtime environment of how it's executed, the image discovery, et cetera. Today, the OCI is focused primarily on the runtime format and the runtime environment. Over time, what I'd like to see is that app container, more and more of the app container spec that actually helps build this full user experience story uh, end up in OCI, but that's not where we're at today. Um, so the, the things that they kind of define in the runtime are very similar. The only tweak is that OCI is focused on this single app um, versus app C, focusing on multiple apps executing together. Uh, and so that's, that's been the primary uh, thing that we've been focusing on, just this runtime. But the images and everything else, I think, are the, what actually create the user experience that's useful. All right, so I um, wanted to come to some conclusions. So first is that uh, Rocket is something that I think is very useful uh, in Mesos or otherwise, and it's a standalone tool that you can use. It's all statically compiled. It should run on Fedora or Ubuntu or CentOS or whatever you happen to have as long as it has a Linux kernel. Um, and hopefully that kernel is relatively modern so the container stuff actually works. Um, if it doesn't work, let us know. Um, it's an open source project that we built because we felt like it needed, needed to exist. Um, etcd is another place where I think uh, uh, the Mesos ecosystem and the CoreOS ecosystem could play a little closer together. Um, there's this issue that's been open for, for a very long time called Mesos 8, 1806, um, whereby a zookeeper um, would, or the, the, plug, the back end that Zookeeper is used for um, would be pluggable to be able to support etcd as a back end. Um, I know that uh, the work went in. I think it mostly worked, and then it never was merged. I have no idea what's going on there because I'm not a Mesos developer. Uh, so if any, any of you are and you're interested in replacing Zookeeper with etcd, um, that would be a place that you could get started. Um, the application container spec is something that we're continuing to develop because it's part of what makes, uh, makes Rocket Rocket is having this application container spec. And so um, if you're interested in this stuff and kind of feeling out what are the user stories around these containers and images and uh, like a global namespace for them, um, join there. Um, the OCI is also a place that we're spending a lot of time, or I'm spending a lot of time, uh, making sure that we have a shared standard for how all this stuff works together. And part of my role there is to, one, make sure everything uh, makes sense, it meshes well, it, it makes sense with how the Linux kernel works, and then also to make sure that um, you know, these user stories that we've defined and these, these uh, 
semantics that are in the app container end up showing up in the OCI. Um, this is going to be an important thing for our industry that we, make, we get it right and that we don't end up in a world where we have essentially the apt and RPM of, of package formats. Um, having worked at an RPM-based distro company, um, seeing, seeing the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of engineering hours lost because people are like, oh, I have to transform this deb file into a spec file. Um, I'd really like it if the next 25 years of my career was not spent um, doing that. So if we could all just work together here, um, it would be a, I, I think we, we, could, we could save some lives, people. Okay? Um, so, so yeah, uh, that's the open container spec. And um, that's all I got. So I'll open up questions, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Yes. Still on the spec container stuff. Yep. Um, when you talk about like the security requirements, like so, we had to do a was that just for networking? Sure. Yeah. What did that put? Um, I was so uh, that's something that we want to get to, um, but essentially, in order to be able to talk to the dev KVM device, you need to be more or less running as root. Um, there's some things that we can do there, but um, user, so we, we also integrated user namespaces support. There's a lot of things that need to happen all together for you to be able to run an unprivileged container, um, and we're just not there yet. Uh, it's something that our team's pushing on, um, but it's gonna be a while. But the important thing is, is that for the most part, you trust KVM and you trust your, your container runtime. The important part is we need to make sure that we're A, verifying what we downloaded via the internet is actually what we intended, um, we're not getting man in the middle. And then B, um, we, we download that stuff as a non-root user, because that's going to be where the bugs are that own our box, is talking to the internet <laughs> and not, not actually trusting who we're talking to, and then essentially allowing them via some bug to escalate privileges from root to, well, they're already root. So um, being able to escalate privileges. Uh, yep. But outside that VM, there is a process running on the host system. Uh -huh. Yeah, because of because of how KVM works, that it, it's it's yeah essentially I'm I'm launching a hypervisor every time, and that's what's happening. Yep. Good question. Yeah. So uh, Mesos has some understanding of the Docker runtime enough to get containers up and running yep. in a fairly integrated manner. Yep. You mentioned that the Rocket support was not that far along yet. Well, what is the state of the art for getting Rocket containers launched in Mesos? It should work because Rocket Container is just a process. Um, so yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't think there should be any work. It, it should just be like, instead of Python, you run Rocket or whatever. Part of the, the work is taking the, the Mesos task definition with which limits it has, which capabilities it needs, and transforming that into the command line. Right. So that's, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, it's not actually necessary. So you can actually just isolate Rocket inside of a C group, um, and then it will essentially be, yeah, because, because you're able to fork an exec, you don't have to, do anything. Um, so that's actually why we, part of the reason we did it was because we want to run more and more uh, of the, the core OS, the core OS Linux core services under a container. Um, and we want to run those underneath system D. And running a, a Docker client under system D and then telling system D, system D kill, it cleans up that C group, but it doesn't clean up the thing that Docker forked in exec. Um, and that's part of the reason why, like, We've, we've tried to fix this upstream with Docker and it, it just didn't happen for a variety of reasons. And so that's one of the reasons why we built Rocket like we did. Um, we want to separate the concerns of how is the container set up and configured, et cetera, from how is it executed. Because um, fork exec has been a, a very long tradition in Unix um, and losing that is a pretty big thing. Yes? Right. Right. So um, one of the things that we wanted to enable, and one of the motivators for creating the app container spec, is that the Docker file has done fabulous things for the ecosystem. It created a UX that's very easy for people to get started. 
Um, the downside is that it creates really cruddy looking containers. Um, they're containers that are huge. Um, they're containers that are hard to understand what actually, what the provenance of the things that went into them are. Um, and so they, they created the, the good UX, um, but we need to enable people to have smarter built containers that run through you know, existing CI CD workflows. And so the reason we built the spec was we wanted to have the ecosystem have a, essentially a binary format that they can build using whatever tools they have available. Um, they're able to put in metadata that explains the provenance of that thing. So, you know, arbitrary key values of, it included this version of the Python source code, it came from these Git trees, et cetera, in the thing, um, and then upload that to the internet. So the, the direct, the, the comparison to spec files is probably not the best thing. It's more like RPM and devs versus um, anything else because it's, it's about a binary format that doesn't matter how it's built, but we share the, the, the format itself. Right. Right. So we, we, our intention from the beginning was for uh, AppSea to be something that we worked with with Docker, um, and we sent pull requests to do that. Um, that didn't get, end up getting merged for a variety of reasons, um, and so we're working together again on the OCI. If the OCI has all the semantics of um, AppSea, not necessarily the syntax, I don't care about syntax, but if it has the semantics, um, I'm perfectly fine having the AppSea essentially being subsumed by that OCI. And really legitimately, my goal here is I want to have a shared spec um, so that no matter what build system created it and no matter what runtime it's, it's designed to be under, there's a single binary that the, the, system, the software developer, the, the software uh, vendor has to con be concerned with. Yeah, so that's, so the question was, uh, is there any concept around ACLs whereby I can grant particular users the ability to run um, only images under certain namespaces? And that's something that we intend to do. Right, right now our key store is very binary. So we say you're able to run things um, as long as the, the appropriate key for that container is in there. Um, but you could imagine, say, have, uh, you know, set up sudo or whatever that would have a wrapper that would say your key store is instead of under Etsy Rocket, its default is Etsy Rocket slash limited user, and then include only keys under there that um, that 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 are that are mapped to images that um, that user is able to launch. And so um, one thing that uh, I didn't really explain too deeply, it's sort of an implementation detail, but um, we have the concept of two different types of keys in the key store, um, and the, there's root keys, and so root keys are able to sign anything, and then there's prefix keys, and prefix keys are only able to validate for particular names. And so you can see in here that um, the, the key that I imported is only able to sign for and validate for example.com slash host info names, uh, that, that prefix. Yeah. Okay, no further questions? All right, thank you so much.